Welcome to the Untold Civil War. And tonight we have a real treat because I am sitting with William Eichler. He is a rock star in the motion picture industry. Uh, most recently, he's been the director of photography for the show Chicago Fire. But of course, we all know and love him for his work producing and directing uh, Civil War Digital Digest, right? Um, and now he's got a new project, uh, History Fix, which is a streaming service, which is bringing awesome historical content to all its viewers. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Ah, thrilled to be here. Uh, now, The Untold Civil War is going to the movies tonight, which is going to be great fun. Last time I did this was with a good friend of the show. Uh, he's also the VP of the Civil War Roundtable of New York, Mike Connors, and we discussed Horse Soldiers starring John Wayne. Uh, this time, Mr. Eichler will be discussing uh, with us a couple of his short films set during the Civil War, the first being Hold My Horse and the second being Whitney's Medal. But before we get into that, I got to ask you the big origin story question. When did the Civil War bug bite you? Oh, wow. Well, first off, if we're doing Civil War at the movies, I don't know who brought the popcorn, but I don't have any here. So we need to work on that <laughs> next time. Absolutely. So, no, the Civil War bug bit me really young. I grew up uh, actually on the farm my grandma was born on in rural Michigan with a in a small town with a actually an outstanding library and i ended up finding a book called rifles for weighty a caldecott winning uh children's book and it was about a, a young lad in the union army who helped break up a weapons running ring trying to get weapons to confederate general stand weight oh fantastic i actually haven't read that one <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually a, for Civil War Digital Digest, a sneak peek behind the uh, behind the scenes there. I'm about to go back and reread it and take a look at it and probably we'll do an episode looking back because I think one of the big things we talk about there and we'll get into with this because it all sort of fits together is connection. How do you find a connection to history for this fifth or sixth grade kid? It was an amazing book. Sometimes it's being at a park. Sometimes it's meeting a living historian. Sometimes it's watching a great movie. So going back to talking about your origin story, how did that develop from reading that book as a child to finally starting the Civil War Digital Digest? Oh, my goodness. Well, there is a whole bunch of years in between because Civil War Digital Digest is only eight years old. And you can bet from my white hair that there's a lot more between a sixth grade kid and the start of Civil War Digital Digest. I got active in the living history community and Civil War reenacting in the very late 80s, very early 1990s, and have been pretty solidly active since then. Uh, around the time of the 150s, my friend Jeremy and I started looking at how we could help Michigan experience the Civil War, and we started a website called AllMichiganCivilWar.com. And we were going to do a whole bunch of photography. And he and I took a three-day trip to the East Coast or a four-day trip to the East Coast. And we saw seven battlefields, like five national cemeteries, all in these four days. It was shoot and move and shoot and move. And it was uh, shooting. It was all stills. We were doing stuff for the website. One evening, he and I had had dinner. And we've been great friends for years. I stood in his wedding. We've worked together on things. And we were doing the website, and then we got thinking while sitting out and having a whiskey before the evening was done, said, Jeremy said, well, what if we take some of your video skills and do some stuff to help living historians do better at their impressions? I still have the sheet of paper or the notepad where we started taking notes on, and that's a very treasured piece for me because that was the end of May. We shot the beginning of July and we started airing, I think, in August or September. It was a very fast track when you talk about what it takes to get something off the ground organized and shooting. We shot like six episodes that first day. And yeah, we're a lot better at giving presentations now, but I'm really not that bummed out. I'm still pleased the way the episode that I did on rations in the Civil War still holds up pretty well. Would I do something different now? Absolutely. Am I still proud of it? Definitely. Uh, and Jeremy was with me for the first five or six years. And then after standing in his wedding, he and his wife, Felicia, bought a uh, farm that is actually was owned by a Civil War veteran. 
and they've started heritage breeds and you now see jeremy and felicia come back but they but he couldn't do both so he left the series and about a year later uh my friend andy roscoe came on board uh masters in history out of norwich and working both as a business partner and a staff historian we continue forward in season eight of civil war digital digest and its companion revolutionary gazette same idea in the american revolutions in its third year I mean, it's fantastic. You know, I've been watching it on YouTube a lot, and really, it's great stuff. My question is, were, were you like the, I think you were really early on into bringing this sort of content, especially about the Civil War, to the internet like that, weren't you? I mean, in, in I don't recall Civil anything like that ever, uh, back then, or even now, you're still a whole step above the rest. Well, that's occupational hazard because of what I do professionally, I think. And just we've got, and we based the digest on some very firm tenets. I did not, and Jeremy did not, and now Andy does not. We don't want to say when we talk about something for living historians, most specifically, hey, I've done this for 20 years. Let's do it this way. This is a great chance to let someone out of history stand up take a bow and tell their story and saying it that way that that's the real touchy feely way of saying hey we use a lot of primary sources around here let's let the people who were back then speak let's let the veterans accounts speak let's take those i might have a different way of doing it because i because that's the way i used to do it in my hobby now you better believe i'm making some modifications and changing i'm part of the progressive community how do we progress? How do we take those further steps? Somebody once said, progressive is not a destination. It's a journey. And that's one of the fun things within living history and within larger history. What do you keep, what do you keep experiencing? Whether it's learning, whether it's enjoying, how do you get there? Well, for sure. I mean, just watching everything you do for Civil, uh, Civil War Digital Digest, it feels authentic. I mean, from the, the props that you're using, the uniforms that you're using, mm -hmm. the setting that you're using, it all feels very authentic. I mean, it's a great job. It's the goal. Thank you very much. It's the goal. And the goal is when somebody comes with us uh, a foreign episode, whether you're looking to learn something or whether you're an armchair general looking to just experience something going, I'm never going to sleep out in the cold, but I'm going to listen to what you have to say about how soldiers campaigned in the cold. Great. Whichever camp you're in, you can get something out of it. And when you asked about were we one of the first ones, obviously we tip our hat to Townsend's in the Revolutionary War world. I mean, let's face it, over 1 million subscribers on YouTube. John and his team are the big boys in the history space. We definitely were some of the first ones in the Civil War space, and we're probably some of the longest, most consistent. We've been producing content at least every other week for eight years. And, you say, and with Patreon coming up, uh, one of the things we did is when we hit a certain point in funding with our patrons, we committed, we'll put two more episodes on, we'll do two more. And so now our target is 30 episodes a year, uh, thanks to the patrons' financial support. And so there's a couple of times where we should be doing one every week for, for three weeks. And with a full-time job and me doing most of the editing, there's a lot going on. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. Um, you know, I, that's one thing I admit is that when I had to go from just doing audio to also doing video, I realized, man, that's a whole nother ball game. It's a whole yes, nother it world. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a heck. So I feel free, man, but it, it's, it's definitely, there's passion there. We can see it. You know, it's a, a love hate relationship, right? There's um, no hate. There's no a hate. love, love, and sometimes <laughs> shake your head on the way to bed and then fall down <laughs> flat, but there's no hate. Fantastic. Well, one thing I like to hear when you're saying that the decision was made, um, you know, over, you know, a glass of whiskey and talking with friends and you said, okay, we're going to come up with Civil War, Civil War Digital Digest. What about Hold My Horse? I mean, now that we're getting into the films, how did this idea come about? I really love this one. Just going, first of all, I really love this uh, short film that you did because it's a story that stands the test of time. I mean, whether you're reading from it from a civil war perspective, or you're kind of relating to it, even in a modern day, you can see this happening, you know, anywhere, you know, and I feel like that's what's really cool about this story. How did you find this story? I mean, is it a true story? And, uh, you know, let's go from there. How did I find it? And is it true? Let's take it backwards. Yes, it's a true story. 
um, my love to history, you come through the 69th New York. I come through the Red Diamond Division, the first fellas to ever wear patches. I mean, if you're a fan of the Screaming Eagles, if you're a fan of the Big Red One, all of those patches come from one patch, and that is a red woolen lozenge by Phil Carney. The two regiments I'm close to are the 3rd and the 5th Michigan Infantry, and the one of the color bearers of the 3rd Michigan Infantry, his name was Dan Crotty. He wrote an account after the Civil War called Four Years Campaigning in the Army of the Potomac. Uh, we privately published it with a printer here in Michigan years ago, and Bill Stiple did a running of it through Belgrove Publishing. Uh, Bill's a fantastic author and publisher, just did his magnus opus on Carney, and I give him a huge shout out. That thing is the size of a family Bible, and I am loving working my way through it. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this story is in Crotty's book. I've known it since as a 16-year-old kid. And when I transitioned from my first season of Chicago Fire to Chicago PD, I run into a dolly grip and direct and in a horror movie director by the name of Tim Troy. We've become really good friends and writing partners. His dad was a reenactor for a little while and Tim was a history buff. We started looking to do something other than horror because Tim wants to direct professionally and let's not stay all bracketed in a genre. And I said, hey, I've got this story. And uh, actually, he was my dolly grip for three years on Chicago PD, and we're sitting here beating our heads against the wall trying to figure out how to make this story work. And then one night on an exterior night scene, it hit, and I think I still have the voice messages on my iPhone because when things started working, we just started talking through it and going and going and going. And that was in February. It was really cold out that night. We shot it in July when it was really, really hot up at Wade House in Wisconsin. And for those of us who might not know the story, and of course, I don't want to give too much away, definitely go watch the movie. Can you give us sort of a gist of what happened? Sure. It is, the story is a moral story, and it's a story about a general who teaches a lesson to a young lieutenant about treating men with the respect of being men, not just salute. You know, it's the whole, we talk about, are you saluting the man or are you saluting the straps? The youngster was saluting the straps, and Richardson wanted him to salute the man, and Richardson is the main character in the story. Of course, it's Israel Richardson fighting Dick Richardson, who, by the way, gets the name Fighting Dick, not in the Civil War, but in the Mexican War, and brings his sobriquet forward. Now, you, you mentioned him. He's a true character, as yes. we mentioned. But there's also some other true characters in there, right? I think there's a couple of characters that had some ancestors, you know, with the uh, actors. And then there are there are three other true characters or composite characters straight out of history. One of them... Um, Thomas Sardini plays uh, an, a staff officer by the name of Norval. He, this gentleman's uh, great-great-grandson is a retired Air Force uh, officer and still has his ancestor stuff and is a member of the Company of Military Historians with me and has written stuff about him. We named Norval and set him as a staff officer as part of it. Um, the lieutenant himself. All we know from Crotty is his name is he's a waif of a lieutenant. That's as much as we have, but he's a true character. And then we modeled one character. He's really a composite character, best we can tell. But if you look in the Library of Congress in the wet plates, and there is a wonderful photo of Richardson, just as shabby and as regular, not pompous as he ever was, sitting in front of his tent with the walls rolled up with a wooden floor. He's in a commercial sack coat, totally unbuttoned, sitting back with a black hat. And with him is an African-American man sitting on the ground next to him. We gave him a name and we let him be part of the story because between him in the photograph and then Richardson's home unit was the second Michigan's who we entered service in the civil war with. Uh, there is a fellow by the name of Camburn who wrote an account that his great granddaughter published a few years ago about the second. And they talked about finding several self emancipated slaves, uh, eight of them who had been on the run for about a month. And after finding them, one of them would not survive the day succumbing to the exposure. But of the rest, I just, 
I can't prove it, but I've got a really good instinct that the man sitting in that wet plate photograph is one of the seven remaining. That's fantastic. And another thing I'd like to talk about is it feels authentic. The uniforms, they look great. One thing that really jumped up to, jumped out to me is the red ribbon around the dispatches that the officer has to deliver. Where does that come from? Is that, is that, is that real? Red Tape and the Rebellion is what it was named by Bob Sullivan when he did CDs of paperwork. It is in the regulations. Red Tape is sent out, and that is how some things are shipped back and forth. It's in the regulations within the stationery that is given to officers that you can requisition. Fantastic. <laughs> but, you know, we don't hang our hat on it. It just happens. And that's one of the big things that we're pushing as we tell more historic stories. You know, when we get to Whitney's Metal, you and I could sit down, run the movie here or run the movie somewhere and it could walk through. Matter of fact, if you uh, either take the seven day free trial or subscribe to, uh, to History Fix and you watch it, there's commentaries for all of these. And I'll talk you through each of these shows uh, with Hold My Horse, Tim talked about all the movie making and all the, okay, this officer and this actor and this and this. I'll talk you right through where the history and what you're seeing is I had to do both with my director's commentary for Whitney's Metal. But, you know, the goal is, hey, just let it be. So often people say, hey, you don't watch Hollywood for history. I still will say that with this. We still have to take a few licenses but there's also stuff that a teacher could set down, show their students, somebody could be engaged with it. And afterwards, you could have a conversation about what you just saw and what you didn't realize you just saw, but you still caught going by. Right. And I actually did that. I did watch the commentaries afterwards and it's well worth it. It's well worth it. There's just so much history. And sometimes, uh, you know, you digest things by watching it but you don't realize that each one of those things that you're digesting was planned. It was planted. It was there for you to catch and you didn't even notice it. It was that smooth, that seamless, you know, and it did its job. Uh, That's well, cool. Cause, cause yeah. first enjoy the story. If you've enjoyed the story, and that's one of the one of the tenants I've worked for with the narrative stuff. And one of the tenants we've worked for with history fix. If you tell somebody, Hey, come learn history with us. If they had a bad time in high school history, they're not sticking around. If you say, hey, come enjoy a story. We got a story to tell you. You catch them the first time and they enjoy that story, they'll come back. Absolutely. And that's what it is. I mean, when you're teaching history, trying to tell these stories is what they are. They're stories. I've had it where I had great, great teachers who taught me great history and they told a story. But I've also had it where there was a teacher who was fantastic. He was a great professor, but history wasn't his thing. And he had to teach one little history class, just a class. And it was just a timeline, date, event, date, event, date, event. And it was, it was brutal. And it sorry, was that moment. You, I had to wake up. I fell asleep yeah. there. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's why I realized that's, that's what it is. When people say, oh, I don't like history. That's their only experience sitting there and trying to learn history. But when you yeah. come out and actually give them a story, it changes everything. Yep. You know, and one it's the thing same thing. It's going to say it's the same thing in Civil War Digital Digest. Part of the reason we we stop rolling when a jet flies over, and we edit around, and we make sure that the background is clean, and we work with historic sites to do good backgrounds because the more we get you to immerse, the more you can escape for a little bit. I love that you brought up backgrounds because that was another thing I want to talk about in uh, Hold My Horse is the camp scene. I mean, there's a lot of wood structures there. There's a lot of mud as well. <laughs> that but, mud was a character and that mud was rain between Saturday night and Sunday morning. And I was sleeping in General Richardson's tent personally and walked out a couple of times to the camera gear and knocked the rain off the pop-ups. <laughs> so see, this is the sacrifices you have to make to bring history alive, right? Part um, of it. <laughs> <laughs> but how authentic is that? I mean, did Civil War camps look like this? I think most people would think of the camps with these Sibley tents and such, but did they have these wood structures? I mean, we set this story right before the Union Army moves onto the peninsula in early 1862. So these fellows are still in winter quarters. Some are in stockaded tents. Some would be in crude huts. Matter of fact, we shot this up in Greenbush, Wisconsin at the Wade House Historic Site. 
And this actually, it's sort of sad to say, as we're recording this, we're about a month ahead of what will probably be the final Wade House. They've been shut down for three years as far as their Civil War reenactment with COVID. Living historians were given permission to build this set of winter quarters, and it just did not hold up over time and it was only planned to be there for so many years and so upcoming will be the last uh wade house civil war reenactment as we know it and we'll see what it becomes going forward um but those fellows were great we went to the wisconsin historical society i'm proud to say one of the larger chunks of money that went out in the cost of the short was a location use fee well that went straight to the wisconsin historical society and is helping them and so we paid for used to be there but that helps the historic site that's another way in creating high-end historic uh, stuff that we can go ahead and help with so um and then we we're able to use those winter quarters but it serves a practical storytelling purpose too not only do we get to see winter quarters but Tim and I were having a real conundrum, and that is the story of Hold My Horse without going deep into the story. Structurally, it's a parallel day story. You meet the wife of the lieutenant, you meet General Richardson, and they both go about their day until they collide. Okay, wonderful. That's great. Now, how do we make it visually easy for the public to see when you're with the lieutenant? And when you're with the general, especially somebody who's just maybe watching their first Civil War movie and doesn't know all the ins and outs of shoulder straps and uniforms, right? Great. The general's camp has the winter quarters and has the wood structures. The lieutenant is coming from a marching regiment, and they're all in canvas. It's a little bit of a historic license, but it gives us the ability to very quickly, when you watch a show, know whose home you're in and where you're going. And I felt that too. I almost, it kind of harkened back to when I watch movies about World War I in a weird way, where you talk about guys who are marching and then moving back towards HQ where things are built up a little bit more. It just felt natural to me that that was something you would see or experience back then. Great. Now, Moving on a little bit to Whitney's Medal, because I really want to get into this movie because I've always been fascinated with these stories of Medals of Honor. Uh, I used to, I did a huge project on that when I was in high school, so I'm really fascinated with these stories. Well, Whitney's you've Medal. given away the end of the story already, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Not that, but you know, that being said, though, you can find that story, right? You know, you can uh, absolutely. You know, right. But uh, the name of for people who didn't know when we did the film festival circuit, Whitney's Medal, M E T T L E, his strength. That is a complete play on words. Right. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, how did you find this story? I mean, this is such a great story. I found it. There's a book called Deeds of Valor. It's now one, if you get the reproduction uh, or the modern binding, it is one volume uh, published early turn of the 20th century in 19 aughts. Uh, it was two volumes back then. And they interviewed many of the Medal of Honor winners and put a compilation of what they did. And I was floating through it looking for a story to tell, looking for a story to direct. I'm on the road toward directing myself. And in the network world, one of the things you need to do is have a short film. Who's going to give you permission to shoot an episode of a network television show that spends literally millions of dollars in eight days, and you're the person making the creative decisions if you don't have proof of concept, you can't show. So how are we going to show directing skill and understanding and visual storytelling? You make a short film. Okay, great. What? Where do we go? was looking for one that was possible. And then it became even richer than being from Michigan. Whitney's with the 11th Michigan, and it's a Michigan story. It was not intentional. It was quite accidental. The one thing about Whitney's Mental is that you actually film a battle. I mean, you're filming a battle. And I mean, what, what I really want to get into is the fact that you didn't have that big of a cast. And yet I'm watching this film, and I am fully buying that there is a full a civil war battle being waged hmm. right in front of me with thousands and thousands of troops divisions going at it but you have a small cast how does that movie magic happen that movie magic happens in quite a number of ways and with what we ran into with people's last minute scheduling had a bunch of people dropping from the main shoot that means we actually shot this location this movie in three different states 
The primary shoot is, was at uh, Jim Phillips, who's a member of the Alton Yeager Guards at his 20-acre farm in southern Illinois. Uh, a friend of ours, Chris, told us, hey, you need to check my friend Jim's farm out. And when I was standing at the Chickamauga battlefield where this actually happened and Jim's farm, there's a spot right there that is a dead ringer for it. Um, then not having enough fellows who showed up with Confederate kit and running out of time because of a couple of really bad rainstorms during filming at Jim's. I talked to friends back in Michigan in my home state and they said, yeah, come on over. One of the things I hate doing as a member of the living history community, and I try like the Dickens not to do, is to film at a reenactment. Civil War Digital Digest almost never shoots at events. We might shoot right after, but shooting at's incredibly rare. Living history events, whether reenactments or living histories, that's for us. It's for us to talk to the public sometimes. It's for us to be with each other and have an experience. I'm not going to go try and necessarily film that if I don't have to. It's a very rare thing. Not to mention with a film, I may have to say, hey, let's go do it again. Let's try this one more time. Well, friends of mine who I've known for literally decades in Michigan said, come on out to the event after Saturday's done, we'll give you a couple hours. And a lot of the Confederate uh, main ranks and a lot of firing, a lot of that took place in Michigan on a Saturday afternoon in about 90 minutes. <laughs> we, wow. shot we shot really fast. Uh, fortunately, I know how to use lenses very well. And I didn't even have a director of photography with me. I set my own iris. Uh, my uh, my first assistant, my focus puller was a huge help. But it's like, okay, put the camera here. It's going to do this. I've been shooting and, uh, and operating for a lot of years. And I know how to shoot Civil War combat. And to create a difference between the Confederates and our heroes, the Union in Whitney's Medal, because of course it's William Whitney's story, <clears throat> excuse me, I was trying to treat the Confederates a little bit differently visually. And that is I tried to treat them like we always did. One of the problems making Civil War combat interesting compared to like, say, a Saving Private Ryan, as soon as you go, hey, we've got a long line of troops and you get back and you see that whole long line of troops, you've just gotten back. You're away from them. You're not with them. You're seeing the big line. And I intentionally did that with the Confederates. We're in front of them. We're near them. We're uh, always e using a dolly or a tripod. So it's very static, very graceful, very beautiful. The way we've almost always shot Civil War combat. When you go to the Union side, it's all handheld. A lot of it is from behind the ranks. Well, it's my director of photography. It's really cool to see the guns fire and get out in front. Yep, but it's even more cool to storytelling to be in the mud with those guys crawling around behind the earthworks. Now, uh, I mean, there must be, you know, you guys are crawling around, fighting, you know, all of this going on, you know. There's got to be some humorous moments or maybe even people, God forbid, getting injured. No, I mean, it seems we like it's pretty a little, close We had quarters. a little bit here and there. <laughs> now, it, it always happens. There's always a head shake. There's always stuff. Um, Justin Hillstrom, who plays Corporal Schultz, my goodness, did his own stunts. And that fall, every time he fell, scared the dickens out of me. I was like, okay, is Justin going to get up? Okay, he got up. Great. Let's go on. <laughs> so uh, we did use, you know, we did go to Hollywood prop houses. You see bayonets being used. Well, Sergeant McDonald, uh, Justin, or not Justin, uh, running up and down the ranks, Sergeant McDonald, you don't see it very well. There's a rubber bayonet there because we don't want him stabbing anybody. So when ne when necessary, we'll drop back to some Hollywood magic to make sure everybody is safe because everybody goes home. Now, another part of this, which I loved about this movie, was that you build the suspense. Whether the audience realizes it or not, you're feeding them little cues that yep. when that pivotal moment happens, when that climax happens, you know it's time to go, Right. How how did you do that? Is that in the writing? Is that in the uh, directing? Where does that come from? They always say a movie is made three times. It's made in the script, it's made in the shoot, and it's made in the edit. And I think every time it gets richer and richer. My friend Ryan, uh, who's an editor, talks about editing being an upside down triangle and you just work your way down and down and down and down until the very best is what's left. 
And that's where that is. We had a magnificent editor, Dan McGuire, who's done other stuff for both Tim and I. He edited both Hold My Horse and Whitney's Metal. He did a great job with Whitney being an action movie. And of course, us being low budget, we didn't have every single shot every time. And Dan was squeezing blood out of a stone sometimes visually. Then you hand it to Landon Knobloch to write a custom score for this, and you turn it over to Michael Lux to go ahead and do the sound mix. And it takes every bit of that, everything, you know, and the big thing I wanted to do with the story is just keep putting layers of pressure on Whitney. Okay, Lieutenant, last round. Use it. We have to hold. Fire that wounded guy's weapon. We don't have enough ammunition two brothers played by twins and one of them gets shot and Whitney's watching one brother try to tend to his other brother you watch every bit of this just and then wounded uh Corporal Schultz I'm coming with you you can't march I don't care I can't make it to I won't make it through a confederate prison pen just layers and layers and layers of pressure on Whitney until he looks over the works and Whitney when interviewed I was had run into the story first and then Deeds of Valor later, actually. And I heard, and it's like, okay, how does he go get cartridge box? I'm like, it had to be his boys were carrying Springfields and there, and the Confederates had Enfields. Well, lo and behold, you read Whitney's interview. I guess right. And it's sometimes the most logical answer is the one. The Confederates had Enfields, the Union had Springfields. He knew that it was a thousandth of an inch smaller and the ammunition would work. And to have that tech, technical expertise to make that decision, right? To be able to mm-hmm. look, and I love how you make it visual for us, right? How does how does a soldier have that technical uh, knowledge? Well, you know, by looking through his binoculars and seeing those uh, rifles and making that decision is it makes it very clear for people who might not know about soldiers and what they know and their technical skills, right? Yep. Um, Another thing is uh, down to even the blankets, right? I think you mentioned something in the blankets in the commentary when they lay out the blanket to count the cartridges. Even that's uh, real, uh, authentic, right? Well, sure. Uh, about a week. Don't quote me on how many days before the Battle of Chickamauga, the 11th of Michigan had been ordered to drop its packs, and we're going to march forward and do this. Well, they marched forward, did it. And never got back to their packs. So this regiment is working without its knapsacks. They're scavenging off Confederate dead and wounded to get things. You see those two twin brothers. One of them is drinking a canteen. I'm going to have somebody from the living history community give me a heart. Why did you have a Confederate drum canteen in a Union ranks? Well, that's because they were out of water. Their canteen detail had gone away earlier in the day. Uh, It came back but it came back with no more water in the canteen. So these fellows were scrounging there. So what we did uh, when the ammunition comes back, give me a blanket, okay? Nobody's got blanks there. Somebody throws uh, an obviously civilian coverlet in. Inappropriate for most Union impressions. Works great for some Confederate. It is something that was picked up. It's just a little cute. It will it, you know, the ammunition. You look at those ammunition bundles. It's Confederate ammunition there. Uh, matter of fact, a friend of ours, Tim Koenig, 3D printed 10 rounds of ammunition and hand wrapped them so we didn't have to have that much powder in. And we had that going. And so we could have those for movie props. We're looking actually through Civil War Digital Digest with Tim and being able to provide that for people for either their own movies or school presentations or museum use because we think it's a good idea. But right now, it was a way to see that stuff. But okay, there's Confederate, there's uh, Confederate. Enfield ammunition. These little cues, will it make a difference to somebody just enjoying the story for the first time? Absolutely not. Does it make it richer for the uber history buff? Yep. Have we created now a level where both of those groups can enjoy this story? You got it. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. And like I said, this is the type of movie that I watched two or three times just to see, okay, what else can I catch him on? Like, what else did he plug in there? You know, kind of sort of a where's Waldo for history buffs, you know? Yep. Um, but in conclusion, how do these short stories, making these short sto- uh, short films and bringing them together for us to see and view and enjoy, how does this help us better understand the war? I think it's a chance to, again, it's that word connection. It's a chance to sit back, enjoy, um, withhold my horse, 
it's an ironic comedy with a moral. You might be challenged to see how one man treated somebody versus how another man treated somebody and see what the proper answer is. Whitney's medal, pressure, 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 act. What decision did he make within the limited scope of his abilities as a junior officer on the left end of a Union regiment? What decision did he make and how did he care for his men the best he could? Just to bring it to a close here, a couple last questions I want to ask you. History Fix, can you tell us about how people can get access to it, you know, and what else is there for us to enjoy? Sure. History Fix is not Civil War Fix. It is History Fix. Again, that's the, the running joke. History Fix. Hey, history addicts, come get your fix. Uh, other streaming services are doing a great job doing documentaries. We absolutely have documentaries. We're also layering movies and short films in. So if you want to just experience history, you can. If you want to learn something, you can. We have some site visits, you can. Uh, we have six branded apps. We did not want to just do this as a website thing where you had to be on your computer. You can get it on Google, Roku, Amazon Fire, uh, anything in the Apple stores. Uh, Historyfix.com is where you can check everything out once you've signed and you can sign up through the apps, but we'd encourage you, Hey, come to the website, have a quick look there, sign up and then download whichever and however many of the apps. Once you have your login, you can go watch wherever you want, including we've got the ability that say you're going to take a flight. You could pull stuff down in app and put it on your phone, on your tablet and enjoy it while you're traveling. Or when you're away from connection, say you're headed to a living history and we're going to lose connection in the mountains, pull something down, watch it with your buddies while you're traveling, just not the driver, please. And what future projects lay ahead? I mean, you know, what's what's coming up for Will? Well, with History Fix, the great thing is we're spreading across eras, and I've got other eras that I totally love, uh, from uh, Leander Stilwell, uh, Sergeant Stilwell in Civil War. We've got a caper comedy that my friend Ivan Ingram is writing that I hope we can do in the next year that is a true story but pulls fictitious characters out of it. Ivan just retired from the Marine Corps. I was trying to find a way to get the script written. I had the treatment, sent it to Ivan, said, hey, do you want to write it? And he called me immediately after he the treatment said, I had these two chuckleheads in my first platoon. He was not as polite as to say chuckleheads. So we've got characters who are, again, based on real people from different time. Uh, we've got a story that I would love to see done uh, out of Don Haggett's book about British soldiers during the revolution that he identified. That's a grenadier sergeant left behind because he has a hernia and can't march with the regiment, ends up defending a family from attackers. Again, what's your duty? What's your choice? Um, I'm totally with you on loving the Medal of Honor. It's something we're watching. I'd love to see more of. I'm working on the Jack Mestrovich story, which is uh, August of 1918. He's a, a Serbian immigrant uh, through Pennsylvania. There's a great story there. And then I just finished writing a treatment that is a question about what's your duty. It's set with the Roman legions with Legio 14 as it leaves Britannia to head for the Danube and a decision of the young legion must make between his common law girl and between his duty to the legion and where do you find the time <laughs> this is great stuff um all i ask is that maybe for one of the civil war uh future projects maybe there could be a, a little cameo for untold civil war there maybe i can uh, sneak a <laughs> shot Love to have you come out with this you know right now we continue to grow one of the big things is how do we continue to provide more ecosystem people who sign up with history fix they're helping get more content because we're doing our darndest to drive the money straight to the producers who build things we still are begging favors and getting help you want to come be in one of these we'd love to have you and we'd love to have you be with us well thank you so much for coming on the show this really means a lot and uh, i hope we can do this again Look forward to it. Thank you very much for giving us a voice and a platform. It's a lot of fun to just sit and visit too, because it's what it's all about with history. Let's enjoy it.